to do. So we're here today to talk about when is a contract a contract. And we're hopefully going to get through that for you. So there's really two issues when we're talking about when is a contract a contract. One is what is required to create a contract. And the second issue is what is required to create an enforceable contract for the sale of real property. So there's more required generally in a real estate sales contract than just a basic sales contract. So let's go through some of those things and see what we can come up with. The first thing we want to come up with is, in a contract, we need an offer. And the most important part for you as Realtors is to make sure that your offer includes all the important terms for the purchase and sale of real estate, whether it's from the seller or the buyer. You've got to have all the important terms. The second thing that we need to have to create a contract is acceptance. We know that because most people presume when they make an offer to sell real estate that they're going to get a counter offer. In fact, that's one of the earmarks of fraud is the seller doesn't counter at all, takes the first cash offer, is happy to go, wants a quick closing. So you're looking for an acceptance. Now the acceptance has to be on all the same terms, the material terms, as in the offer. And sometimes we don't see that. Sometimes we see when we have an acceptance on a real estate sales contract, we may have a signature somewhere. We may have initials somewhere. We don't have everything initialed. What does that do to the contract? We've got something where there's a change. I still see a lot of people using the line through, change the numbers, change the dates, do those things. What happens then if we're not having those things initialed? Does that create a contract? We may not have a contract because we don't show that a meeting of the minds. We don't have an acceptance. The other issue that we can have on acceptance is we may not have a completely signed document. What if FAR bar requires at the bottom, you see there's a line for signatures, initials on the FAR bar contract, and the NABOR contract doesn't have that. What if you get an offer accepted, you think, and it comes back from the other side and every page but one is initial? Do you have an acceptance? Okay, that's the reason the NABOR contract doesn't have those lines for initials, because we're afraid there'll be one page that gets left out. And then there's a claim later on that it wasn't an acceptance. There's no contract because there was a page missing when the person sent back the acceptance and we go back and forth on that. So you have to have an acceptance in addition to an offer in order to create a binding contract. Okay? The other thing you have to have is consideration. Okay, so those are the three black letter rules of law for a contract, an offer and an acceptance that's supported by consideration. The consideration has been watered down over the years that now all we need is the mutual promises in the contract. So it used to be that you had to actually give something up of value in order to have a contract, go from one way to the other, maybe some money, some deposit money, but to have a binding contract, all you need to have are the mutual promises to perform, and that will create a binding contract. Now the key here, remember in the office, offer acceptance and consideration, if you've got an offer and an acceptance, you may not have a contract unless you've got all material terms included. Now what are material terms? Okay. Okay. One of the matters is has to be timely. Okay. You'll notice in both the FAR bar and the NABOR contract, there's a deadline for accepting the offer or counteroffer. Both those forms say that if the offer is, creates a counteroffer, we extend the deadline by two days or some other period of time. You have to look to see if it's timely, if it's accepted in a timely manner. The FAR bar contract says time is of the essence. The NABOR contract, only thing that it says clearly that time is of the essence is the closing date. So if you've got a date in here for an acceptance and it comes back, it's not, it's after that date. Do you have an, you have a contract? Was it timely enough? How many of those deals do we close? A bunch of them. I've got one the other day and I'm not sure why the realtors decided to pick that, but they picked noon as the deadline to respond. Now that's a great time, but what happens when it comes in at 1215? Was it timely? I think, that it, I think it would be because time is not of the essence under the NABOR contract. But no, these are the cases that go to court and we get to find out what the judge says. And if we are then really litigious enough, we find out what the appellate court says. And that's what tells us whether 1215 meets a noon requirement with a contract that time is not of the essence. 
Farbar says time is of the essence. So if it says noon in Farbar, it comes in at 1215. Is that a contract? Certainly the time issue is a problem. Containing all the essential terms. What are the essential terms of a contract? Does anybody have any idea what that might be? Certainly the identity of the parties is an essential term. Would you agree with that? I think you would. How many of you have ever seen an offer that comes in from Jones and or Assigns or Johnson et al.? And I ask people, why do you prepare an offer that way? And the answer uniformly has been, we don't want the seller to know who the buyer is so they can't get in touch with them directly. Well, I think that's terrific. But now the contract doesn't know who the buyer is, okay? So do we have a contract when we make an offer on behalf of Johnson and or assigns? We may or may not because the court might interpret that as ambiguity that we can go outside the contract and figure out who Johnson is and have a contract. But why run that risk? So we want to identify the parties to the contract. That is clearly an essential term. The property itself. You know, the neighbor contract has two places to put a description for the property. We've got a legal description and we have an address. Farbar throws in the property ID number for the property appraiser tax purposes. So we've got three places there. We can't describe the property correctly. We don't have a contract. That's a clearly essential terms. We have to know what we're dealing with, right? So we always suggest that you fill in all those blanks to describe the property. Why do we suggest that? Because if you make a mistake on one and that's all you put in, then we haven't described the property, we don't have a meeting of the minds, we don't have a contract. If you make a mistake in one and you get it right in the other one, then we've got an ambiguous contract and we can go outside of the contract document and determine what the parties truly intended. And that's a big benefit because everybody makes mistakes. Okay? Who here hasn't transposed numbers the wrong way on a phone number? I mean, that's gotta kill you if you're trying to call somebody back that's a customer a potential customer and you got the phone number written down wrong, okay? And that just requires one digit. So be careful with that. And then of course, price. And most of the time we get that right. We know what the price is, but we've got to have agreement on it. Those are three essential terms of the contract. Believe it or not, most of the other terms of the contract are not so essential. And the court cases in Florida say, yeah, we're really not going to give you a clear line on what's essential and what's not essential in any given contract because circumstances can cause that to vary. So what happens is we have at least these three things there. We don't put anything else in. What's the closing date going to be? Anybody have a clue on that? I can tell you the closing date will be a reasonable time from the date of the contract. Okay. And we imply a lot of other terms the same way. What's usual and customary in the location where the transaction is taking place or what's reasonable in the location where the transaction is taking place. Now, the NABOR contract has morphed from a two-page document when I started practicing law down here in 1983 into what's now a 12-page document. So clearly, these contract forms are addressing a lot more than merely the essential terms because they want to make sure that everything is covered that's going to come up in the transaction in a normal residential real estate transaction. And they do a pretty good job of doing that. We're going to prorate items. Who's going to pay closing expenses? What are we going to do? What's the procedure for inspections? What happens if there's defects in property? Those are all covered in the contract forms, and they should be. But if they're not in there, we've got some issues. I'll give you a good example of a provision. If it's not in the contract, it would be very shocking to a seller or buyer, and that is that the buyer assumes the risk of damage to the property from the effective date of the contract all the way through closing. So the property burns down, the buyer still has to buy it. Now the contract forms we use say that that risk stays with the seller until closing, okay, which is where I think everyone believes it should be. But there is an example of how common law says, we've got a term that we'll put into this contract if you don't change it, because it's not essential because we've got something that would cover it. So we want to be sure that we've got these three items included. And since there's no definite list, using a form makes a lot of sense. And being familiar with the form that you use also is a good idea. Okay, so we move back on. Real estate contracts. What's critical there? Okay, a few things that are critical are the statute of frauds. 
You all know that when you have a contract for the purchase and sale of real estate, it must be in writing. Okay, and that's the statute of frauds. There's no ifs, and, and buts about it. Okay? So we need to have that. And that's 725.01 Florida statute. Now it must be signed at least by the party to be bound. And in a real estate sales contract, usually both parties need to be bound in order to have a closing. So we need to get a buyer and a seller. Okay? Now, while we're talking about the signature of parties, let's talk about that because that's an important item that sometimes gets overlooked. Do we have the seller who is actually the owner and has the right to sell, which is called capacity from a legal standpoint, both from a mental capacity and operational capacity and a signing capacity? Do we have the right person signing? You need to be sure with that because there are a lot of issues that go into seller signing that could really foul up a transaction unless you pay attention. One of those is, is the seller signing with the power of attorney. I've had a lot of transactions over the years where Jim Jones is the seller. And it turns out Jim Jones, the owner, is dead. Jim Jones, the son, is operating as the seller. And nobody in the transaction realizes that Jim Jones, the real owner, is dead until we get close to closing. And then somebody says, oh, I'm not really dad. Dad's dead. But I have a power of attorney. Well, that's terrific, except power of attorney died when dad died, so that doesn't work, okay? LLCs, trusts, foreign corporations, all of these entities, generally the signers have to have the authority in either the documents creating the entity or by law. So you need to get that and you need to make sure you've got that. So if we're creating a contract either for a buyer or a seller, and this applies usually to sellers more than buyers, we want to be sure that whoever is signing has the authority to bind the owner of the property. Big mistake people make a lot of times is they're dealing with someone that's dead. They know they're dead. They're dealing with the estate. And the people that they're dealing with say, don't worry. We've got probate going. Everything's good. I've been appointed the executor of the estate. And that sounds terrific until you find out the probate is in another state. And you realize then you have to have probate in Florida for Florida real property. So there again, you've got somebody signing a contract that may or may not have authority to sign, certainly doesn't have authority to close. So you need to be really careful with those aspects when you're getting the parties to sign. So when we get to signature, it's not just getting a signed contract, it's getting a contract signed by the person who has the authority to bind the owner or all of the owners, right? So if we've got a couple that owns it, you'll need a husband and wife or a husband and husband or a wife and wife or partners to sign. Everybody needs to sign that needs to be on there. So it's a good time to do some due diligence, look up in the property appraiser's website, at least the last deed of record of what the property appraiser shows. And one thing that the property does do, property appraiser does do pretty well, at least in Collier, is they update their records when they hear someone has died. And I'm still not sure how they do that and how they do it so quickly, but pretty soon property is owned by the estate of someone and we haven't even opened probate. So be careful with that. Key there, it can be e-signed, it can be signed by DocuSign, it can be signed by email, but we have law that says texts are not significant enough to be a signature or to create a contract in Florida with respect to sale of real property. Okay, So under Florida Statute 668.001, which is our statute that allows e-signatures, Remember, texts don't work, and that's a big deal for the younger generation because the younger generation loves to do everything by phone and text. And if you try to do that and create a contract with that or an amendment, it's not going to happen. It's not going to be binding. Even the amendments to the contract, keep that in mind, have to be signed. So if we're changing something as we move toward closing, it's not because the realtors agreed on it, the parties talked about it, and it's okay. It needs to be in writing and signed by the parties. Okay? Delivery. Delivery is a big deal. Somebody signs an offer and sends it over to the other side. The other side signs it and puts it in a desk drawer. We now have a fully executed sales contract. We don't have a binding contract because it has not been delivered back to the original offeror. So there has to be delivery of the acceptance of the offer or counteroffer. Now that can be confusing because don't confuse that with the effective date of the contract. 
The effective date of the contract, if nothing is said, would be the date that it was delivered, the last signature was delivered to the other side. Okay. NABOR contract says that the effective date is the last dated initials or signature. Barbar says the effective date is the last date and when it's delivered to the other side. Now, when it's delivered becomes a little questionable because we're never quite sure how that's done. It's sent by email. Is that delivery? Well, any of you open your emails at 2 a.m. just to make sure you didn't get anything delivered between the time you went to bed and the middle of the night? Not many other people do that either, so is it actually delivered until they open it? I haven't seen a case on that, but I'm pretty sure the delivery would be a good lawsuit there and a good law, a good law school question is, that a delivery emailing it even though you didn't get it? Something called the mailbox rule that in the good old days, we were sending things back and forth by the post office. If you deposited it in the mailbox, that was considered delivery. But I'm not sure about email. But we have to have delivery, and the reason that's important is because even under the NABOR contract, although the effective date of the contract has a black line definition of being the last dated initials or signatures, we still have to have delivery. So if you're working with someone and you've got the offer, it's gone over, or the counter offer has gone back, it, it behooves you to bird dog that to get it back as fast as you can, because even if the other side signs it, and we now have an effective date, and they've dated it, until they deliver it, there's really no proof of acceptance, and delivery is required in order to have a binding contract, notwithstanding the contract saying its effective date is some other time. So you need to be careful with that. Well, question is, does the delivery apply to notices? And it certainly is implied that it does, because any time that you're required to do something within a certain time frame, but most of those contacts require the performance and then the sending of the notice. I haven't seen a case that argues that it's because I didn't get it until later. It's not going, you know, it doesn't apply. So I think with respect to those things, courts would look at that and say, are we going to let somebody get off the hook because they were late on it? Uh, they, they sent it and it didn't get there until a little bit later or whenever it got in there. I think the delay problem there can be, uh, and the way the NABOR contracts particularly tries to deal with some of those things is, for everything except the statutorily required notices and, and, and items to be delivered to the parties, notice to the realtor is sufficient notice to the party. And that's the effort to get around that. Gee, my realtor got it, but I didn't get it, so it wasn't timely, et cetera, et cetera. But I think the delivery is a good issue, so you need to be careful with that. So you don't send it, if you send it at 11.59 p.m. by email, I think you're probably going to be okay, especially under the NABOR contract, because time is not of the essence. Okay, But at Farbar, with time of the essence, I, I'm not sure how that plays out, to be honest with you. Okay? okay, we talked about the potential signature issues. We talked about capacity contract. Capacity contract becomes a bigger issue in Florida because we are a mecca for retirees. And I have had many of clients that are not at the peak of their game and they're selling their property and they're moving off Marco or they're selling their property that they bought years ago. Not seeing as much of that anymore, but some of those early Deltona buyers and they've held on to it for 40 years. Now they're selling, you know. Um, those folks, do they have capacity to sell? Yes. They, they don't have to be at the peak of their game to sell. But if there's a question about their capacity, certainly they have the ability to contract or not. Uh, that can be an issue. And some of these folks, uh, you know, they're, they're, they're borderline. So it is something that we need to be concerned with. The other thing we have to be careful with, especially with some of the elderly, is is it a voluntary act? Because to have a contract, it has to be voluntary and have to have capacity. So where would it not be voluntary? Has anyone here ever seen a particularly pushy child trying to get their parent to sell a piece of real estate and hopefully get their hands on the proceeds because they need it for some important thing? Was that a voluntary sale? Now, the buyer might not be hamstrung with that problem because it's between the seller and the seller's child. However, if the seller's child has been pushing them and it's not a voluntary act, the buyer may have a problem with that contract as well, certainly as it moves to closing and the other children find out about it. Um, it may happen. Here's a big issue that I'm seeing these days. Parents who are now living in a home that's gone from being worth $800,000 to $2 million or $3 million are now thinking about selling and taking the money out and giving some of the money to their kids. 
And they're not realizing that by selling a property with that much gain, they're going to pay capital gains tax on most of it, even if it's their primary residence. Whereas if they die and their kids inherit it, the kids get what's called a step-up basis, and they get it as if they bought it for what it was worth when their parents died. So for some of these properties, although it might hurt your commission, it's a real tax boondoggle for these folks. If they sell a property that they bought for $250,000 a few years back, now it's worth two and a half million dollars, and they've got a five hundred thousand dollar primary residence exemption, but they're going to be paying capital gains tax on what two point seven million dollars in capital gain, or two point two million dollars in capital gain. So a lot of those folks are much better off letting their kids inherit the property. Now, will you get the listing after that? Sure, the kids aren't going to want to keep the property; they're going to be happy to sell it. But going to sell that three million dollar property for three million dollars and pay no income tax on that is a whole lot better deal for those kids than it was if mom and dad sold it and paid $750,000 in income taxes and the kid got what's left over. So something to look at. So we've got drafting issues. Okay, drafting issues. This is the big issue for realtors in my practice. And it comes from two things. One, not filling in the forms. But two, and the bigger issue is the two primary contract forms used in our area, the Farbar contract and the Nabor contract, they have a bunch of lines at the end of the contract, real close to where the parties sign. And I've always said that although you are authorized by law to fill the blanks in on a preprinted contract, when I look at a blank that takes up six, seven, eight lines or more in a form contract, I'm not real sure that qualifies as a blank to be filled in by a realtor. Okay. And the more you fill in the blank, the more you are drafting. And the more you are drafting, the more you may be practicing law. Worse yet, you may be running afoul of some of these issues. So you have to be very careful when you get to that section. So that's why in either Farbar or Nabor, first line that you should use is to go and look and see if there's an addenda or a rider that you can attach to the contract and do what you want to do. Two reasons. One, both the FAR Bar Committee and the NABOR Committee that drafts the forms spend hours going through those and trying to do a great job and probably are doing a better job than you will do drafting something on the fly. Okay? And number two, now you're not drafting in the guise of filling in a blank on a contract form and you're using a form which you then can fill the blanks in on that form to meet your needs. I think those are the best way to go insofar as avoiding these issues. Ambiguity, we talk about ambiguity. Ambiguity is an issue when you put something in, and that's really what happens most often when realtors are drafting in the blank lines and there's something in the contract that says something a little bit different. Now we've got to figure out what was really intended, and that's where the fight starts. Now, does that happen most of the time? No. Most of the time in life, you get away with your mistakes. They don't bite you in the fanny because it works. But you have to build your method of doing business for those occasions when things go wrong. Okay? It's going to rain on a cloudy day. We know that. On a sunny day, though, probably not. But I have an umbrella in my trunk just in case. So you need to practice that way. So we want to avoid ambiguities. And the best way to do that is to not fill anything in on those lines at the end of the form and use the riders and addenda that are prepared. Now be careful with what you've got here because you've got to make sure that the riders and the addenda match the contract form. So don't mix and match. If you're going to go use a far bar contract form, use the far bar riders. If you're going to use a neighbor form, use the neighbor addenda because there are a lot of reasons to do that. One, there are terms defined in the contract that are brought forward into the addenda that you want to use because the addenda doesn't redefine them. If you use a rider from Farbar with a neighbor contract, you may find that there's a term in the rider that is at odds with a term that's in the contract form, and we have what? We have an ambiguity. We don't want that. Okay? So use those forms, and as I said, they match up with the contract, so you want to try to do them. If you have trouble finding them, spend some time before you're writing an offer going through the rider and the addenda of these things. They're all available in Form Simplicity or any other forms uh, software that you're using. And get familiar with them because they're there. The hard part about using them, for NABOR, all the addenda start out with the term addendum to contract, and you got to try to figure out what it says. With the far bar, 
Uh, the, the philosophy there to make things easy was to throw everything into something called a comprehensive addendum, which is a multi-page document that has almost everything out there. So it's bulky, it's still hard to use. But go through and become familiar with it so you know what's going on. We talked about missing essential terms, critical. You really can avoid that by using the contract form and filling in every blank. That'll do two things for you. One, you'll have all the blanks filled in, so you're not going to miss an essential term, because where are the blanks in these forms? Description of the property, identity of the parties, closing date, purchase price, deposit money, right? deadline for inspections. Some of those aren't particularly essential terms, but they're all important, so you fill in all those blanks. And you fill them in even if the deadline that you're going to use is the same as the default deadline in the contract document. And why do you do that? So your customer will look at what you wrote down. Because my experience has been that your customers generally only review the blanks that you filled in, whatever those might be. And a good example of not filling in a blank and how that can be a surprise to a seller is the residential the vacant land sales contract that NABOR has. In the due diligence period, if you don't fill a date in the blank for how many days due diligence the buyer has, the buyer has 60 days due diligence. And I've had a number of deals over the years where a buyer will have a 45 or 50 day closing and they don't put anything in that due diligence clause, so it's 60 days and the seller doesn't realize it because the seller didn't look at that clause because there's nothing in the blank. And what happens on the 49th day just before closing and the buyer hasn't been able to flip or find financing or whatever the buyer was trying to do, the buyer calls and says, I'm exercising my due diligence clause to get out of the deal. Now, what does that do for the realtor? Well, this is a commission, of course, number one. But number two, how does the listing agent now look to the seller? <coughs> because the seller is going to blame the listing agent for everything that goes wrong with that transaction. And now there's not a deal at all, and the property's been off the market for 49 days. Okay, so important. Fill in all the fill in all the blanks. Make sure you do that. Incorrect property description. Another big error. Where do I see that happening most frequently? Meets and bounds descriptions. Okay, and I see people taking the shorthand description off of the property appraiser's website or some other abbreviation, and they goof it up. If they try to take the whole legal description of meets and bounds and write it out, I mean, when we use those in our office, we read them and double check them and have them read to each other and make sure we've got them right. Okay? So if you're going to do that, my suggestion is try to get the last deed of record and use that as an attachment to the contract if you're not going to write everything out because I think that's going to limit your ability to make a mistake. And again, here, if we use the street address plus have a legal description that might have a mistake in it, now what do we have? We have an ambiguity, we go outside the contract, we fix it. If we don't do that, we've just goofed up the legal because it's complicated or we're too tired to write the whole description, we don't have a contract. Okay. Incorrect party description. I talked about that briefly earlier. It's really important that you have the proper name of the buyer and the proper name of the seller because now we have a contract, we know who the parties are. We often see, gee, we're going to put Mrs. Smith on the contract, and later on in the process, Mr. Smith decides he wants to be on the contract too, or they decide, let's put it in joint name, because that way, if one of us dies, the other one will own it. Anybody ever had a deal like that? I see deals like that all the time, okay? The bigger problem is you start a contract with Mrs. Smith and it's financed, which is what that's about a third of our deals these days, and they go to the bank, and then halfway through the loan process, they say, oh, we want Mr. Smith to be on there as well. And the lender says, great, we'll start underwriting all over again. We could take care of that in another 45 days. Okay, so get it right the first time and get the right names. The other thing that lenders do for your customers, which of course they will blame you for, is the lender will say, don't worry, just take title in your name and then you can transfer it after closing. Okay? I hear that a lot these days with respect to LLCs. I say, well, we don't loan to LLCs, but take title in your name and then we'll let you can convey it by a quit claim deed after closing. And how does that work out for your customer? If there's a mortgage on the property, they have to pay deed stamps as if they're transferring the property for the amount of the mortgage. Okay? So if they have a $500,000 loan, that's $3,500. They were thinking a few hundred bucks for a quit claim deed and they'd be done. Now they're paying a few hundred bucks for a quit claim deed plus $3,500 to the state. Who do they blame for that? 
the realtor. We've long, long since forgotten the banker. And another thing is, um, those Fannie Freddie loan documents say if you change the title to the property, it's a due on sale clause, they can call the note. So I don't know why, what stupid lender would tell anybody that. <laughs> So, <laughs> so we've got issues with due on sale clauses potentially as well. So this is a key here though. You find out who the buyer is really gonna be. And if there's a lending issue, you find a lender that will loan to that buyer, not do it the other way around. Figure out, fit the buyer into the lender's parameters and then change it later because that's generally gonna be an expensive proposition and it's not gonna work as well as these folks wanna do. The other issue that, that I see in that regard, it has not a lot to do with the contract, but it's a lot to do with your customers this is where you can help them, is that I see a lot of people say, we'll do a quit claim deed, and we're gonna transfer back and forth. If they do a quit claim deed, it cuts off their title insurance. And in Florida, if they do a warranty deed, they can make a claim back against themselves as the former owner, then against their title policy. And that's a big deal. That doesn't work in all states, but it works in Florida. So with these intra-family, intra-to-my-entity type of LLC, uh, trusts, transfers that we're going to do for uh, fam family members that are rather incestuous in the nature that they're all in-house, I like to recommend they use a warranty deed or at least a special warranty deed, and that way they have title insurance protection without having to buy another title policy. Still down on that for me for a second. So if I have a husband and wife who want to buy a condo, and the husband says, well, I'm just going to write the contract in my name, but it's closing, we want to vote me on the deed. That causes extra issues with the, there's no quick claim there because they haven't actually. If you've got a, the question is about that one, one spouse is going to get a loan and then they're going to have both spouses on the deed. The, the issue with that is that the lender is going to require the mortgage to be executed by both spouses. And as soon as the lender finds out you're going to have two people signing and two people on title, most of them are going to want to qualify that second buyer to make sure that they qualify for the loan, or at least their credit is sufficient. They're not a problem. Okay. And that's where the problem comes in. Okay. So we've got those issues. We need to be careful. Party does not read or understand the contract. Remember what I said, my experience has been that most of your customers read the lines you fill the blanks and they read the price for sure. I don't know what else they read. I'm always very impressed with my clients come in and they actually want to read through, it takes forever, but they want to read through the mortgage documents as they're signing them. I mean, I'm impressed with them reading them. I'm sad it takes us two or three hours to do a loan closing that way, but I'm very pleased that they're reading through everything and want to understand them because hardly anybody does that, right? You hand them a contract, they go 285, 685, whatever the price is, sign it. Okay, good. I get it. Closing in 30 days. Okay, fine. They don't read the contract. That's it. So, they don't understand the contract. Why does that become an issue? It becomes an issue later on when something goes wrong and they're unhappy. And that's the first thing they'll say is either I don't understand it or they'll admit they didn't read it or they'll blame the realtor for, you know, the realtor lied to me there. It's a conspiracy to, in order to steal my money. Right? Well, his bad news for your buyers that don't read or your sellers that don't read. The Florida courts are uniform in saying that's tough. You sign it and didn't read it, it's the way it goes. And that's another reason why you want to be a transaction broker, because if you're a transaction broker and you do not have a fiduciary duty, then they sign something they didn't read, that's on them. Okay? So be careful with those things. Okay, go through some more statutory requirements. These are all pretty big deals, because if they're not in the contract under Florida law, then the contract is either voidable or a buyer can walk away. Um, because the contract is required to have these things in them. So let's look at what these things are. Disclosures, Condominium Association under 718-503-2D. You all are familiar with that. The NABOR contract has that in big, bold print to meet the requirements of the statute. The FARBAR contract does not. And if that language is not in the contract advising the buyer that the buyer has a right to obtain documents and has three days after the buyer gets the condominium documents, the buyer can walk away from the contract at any time. Farbar contract does not have that language in the contract at all. You need a condominium rider for the Farbar contract, okay? And that is a major problem for some people who deal with neighbor contracts routinely or don't know anything about contracts at all, and they get a Farbar contract on a condominium. I had three deals a few years ago. All of them, a realtor was using, they were somebody from Miami using a Farbar contract for them because that's what they use there. 
and made an offer and it was accepted in all three of those deals, there was no condominium rider. Two of them, the buyer's attorney wrote me a nice note and said, buyer's out, doesn't have any condominium language required by 718, deal's over, want the deposit back, nothing we could do. The third one, the realtor brought the contract into me because it was far bar, they weren't familiar with the form and said, is this gonna work? And I said, not till we attach the condominium rider. And they did, we closed that one, okay? Now, I don't know the other two would have closed with a condominium rider attached, but we'd have sure had a better chance at it, okay? Because the deposit would be at risk. So be careful with that. Homeowner Association, very similar condominiums. Under Chapter 720, the Homeowners Association Act, there's a disclosure summary required in the contract. Okay? That's in the NABOR contract as well. And that tells the buyer that the buyer has three days after the buyer is given the disclosure summary to back out of the deal. Now, the disclosure summary is a separate form. So just because the language that says the buyer has the right to terminate within three days of receiving that information, that doesn't mean that you're done. You have to then get that information from the seller on the disclosure summary and have the buyer sign off on it to show that the buyer has it because the buyer has three days from the day the buyer gets the disclosure summary. Same thing with the condo documents. Just because the disclosure language is in the contract doesn't end the job. The buyer has three days from the day the buyer gets the condo documents to terminate the deal for any reason or no reason. So it behooves you to be sure that the Homeowner Association Disclosure Summary properly completed is delivered to the buyer and that the condominium documents, all of them are delivered to the buyer because until the buyer gets all of them, three days don't start. Okay. Now one of the keys on these things is that if the buyer gets these disclosure summary and all the condominium documents prior to signing the contract, then the buyer three days don't run. Okay. If it's after the contract, three days run. Now, Everybody thinks it doesn't apply to the condominium documents, but it does. So in either case, it behooves you. Now, very rarely are we going to see realtors going out and getting the compiling all the condominium documents, the declaration, the bylaws, the articles, everything else, and deliver those to the buyer before the buyer signs an offer. That's just not going to happen as a practical matter. But it's a lot easier to get that disclosure summary from the HOA, what the assessments are, and have that all filled in completed. And if your buyer signs that before, the buyer signs the contract, the buyer does not have three days to get out of the deal. Okay, something to think about. Radon, under section 404-056-5 Florida statutes, radon disclosure has to be made and that has to be in the contract and there is specific language in the statute that has to be in the contract. Okay, that's in both the neighbor and the Farbar contract, so that's good news for you. Energy efficiency, Florida Statute Section 553.996 requires that a buyer be advised that the buyer can have an energy efficiency of a building tested, et cetera, et cetera. And there's an energy efficiency brochure published by the state that it, the buyer is required to be given before the buyer makes the offer. Okay, so, Same time the buyer signing is fine. If you all are not providing that energy efficiency brochure to your buyers, you should start doing so because if they don't get it, the buyer has a right to get out of the transaction. Property treatment, termites under 689-261 is another disclosure required in the contract. Go ahead. That disclosure in the it is in the neighbor contract. The required contract language is in the contract. The brochure is not. So, so for as with all of the others, there's some additional steps required to meet all of the statutory requirements. But today's presentation is what has to be in the contract. Okay. So we've got property treatment for termites under 689-261. That's a disclosure that's required. Lead-based paint, you're all familiar with that. 42 USC 4852D, that is a statute that says specific language has to be in every contract that tells the buyer of their right to have the property tested for lead-based paint. And the statute itself goes on to require that a buyer be given 10 days to back out of the deal and to test for lead paint. Okay. Now, we don't really worry about that because that's not required to be in the contract, but they do have that right. I know this um, question is fairly new, I guess. So, I had um, as a condo and gave them all the docs that showed all the HOA deeds and all of that and everything. Everything was signed, sent in. The question they had for me today was what if a special assessment happens before it closes? Who's responsible for that? 
The question was, what about a special assessment? Well, there's a good example, talking about special assessments, of a non-essential contract term that it's probably good we have something in the contract to address it. So if you read the neighbor contract, we talk about if it was pending, if it was, if it was adopted prior to the effective date, it's the sellers under the neighbor contract. If it was pending on the effective date, then it can be the buyers as long as it's no more than 1% of the purchase price. So we have a clause in the contract that addresses it and it's important that it's there and that's why it's there, but it's a good example of a, what would be considered a non-essential term and something that the parties would get to argue about if we didn't address it. So I'm just, just go back with what you said, I'm sorry. But so I know you said it was a seller's for the neighbor contract. Um, but what about the pending? What's the difference about when it's pending and 1%? What was that? Okay, I'll talk to you about that after I get done here. Sure. And I have no problem doing that. Sure. But I'll stick to the contract. So we've got lead-based paint and then we've got local ordinances. Now that's really not a big problem here locally. We did have some things pending about what we were going to do about these rentals. Could we do that? But Miami-Dade, uh, all I can tell you is fools rush in. In Miami-Dade, if you're thinking about selling someone in Miami-Dade, uh, I'd suggest you link up with a realtor over there that knows what they're doing. There are a lot of local ordinances and disclosures required in Miami-Dade that I'm, I wouldn't even try to tell you what they are because I don't know all of them. Be careful in Miami-Dade, and there's probably some places around the state have other things that require a local disclosure or something. And I think it's the coming uh, thing because I think government thinks they're going to help us by making sure that buyers are protected from anything that goes wrong. It's one of the reasons that there are these other disclosures in here because they figure you got to give the buyer the declaration and the bylaws of a condominium because they wouldn't ask for it on their own. So all these things are here. So be careful about that local ordinance thing because we never know exactly what's going to come up. Okay. So we've got the conclusion. We want to have a enforceable contract. It must include all required provisions, which means we have to have all the essential terms, and we have to have a meeting of the minds, so everybody has to agree on those. We must have a simple example of a not uncommon error here. The neighbor contracts includes the condo and the HOA disclosures that we talked about, but the FAR bar doesn't, so you have to attach the writer. Now, people that work with the FAR bar contract exclusively they know to do that as a general rule, but even the ones that do that, they goof up and they don't attach it. Well, you, as a professional, you need to be aware if an offer comes in on a condominium you've listed and doesn't have that rider, you need to be sure you attach it. But that's the kind of thing that happens. So the contract needs to be clear, it needs to be correct, and it needs to be co complete. And if you've done all of that, then you should have a successful contract. And that concludes our presentation. Anybody have any other questions? No? Okay, guys. You're welcome. Uh huh. Well, you have to be careful because it depends on where you're cutting it from. Because a lot of those, a lot of those are abbreviated because they're just too long. Some of those meets and bounds descriptions are, you know, three fourths or longer of a legal page. So if you, if you cut and paste from anything other than the deed, my fear is that you end up with a short version of you know, whatever you've got. And so I'm, my concern with that is it's not a complete description and you may not have a binding contract because you don't have a complete description of the property. Now, if you put in the street address or the, you know, the property ID number from the tax uh, collector's office, now we at worst have an ambiguous contract and we're probably okay. But if the only thing you put in was that abbreviated version, my fear would be that's an incomplete description and we can't fix it. And if somebody wants to get out, I think a court probably lets them out because to a judge, there's no harm if I let the buyer get his money back and I let the seller keep his property. Well, then where's the harm in that? You know, they don't care about your commission so much. So they don't, you know, they don't look at it that way. So that, 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 I think that's, I think that's how that would shake out. And I think, so I think it's really important that you try to use at least two descriptions for all the properties that you sell um, because in case you goof one, you got the other one yeah, to fall back on. Right. Well, and, and the problem by using, and again, not to say that that won't work, but let's just, let's just say we do that. Meets and bounds descriptions should scare the heck out of you, quite frankly. But if you use a meets and bounds description, then then you use a street address. Has anybody here ever found that there's a little confusion about the street address when you're out in Golden Gates? I mean, all right, and, and so you, you're writing down and you, you, you take that again from the property appraiser tax collector's office and 
you know, it used to be there wasn't even a street there. <laughs> you know? I don't know. Maybe there are streets out there these days, but th those always worry me. So anytime there's meets and bounds scriptures, I can tell you in my office, they, they really do scare me. And, you know, we have at least two people read those back and forth to each other to make sure that we haven't missed, you know, a, any kind of a call on those and they're all correct and all that. So I recommend if you're not going to do that, as I said before, I think the best way is to go get the last deed of record. If they screwed that one up, I mean, I don't know, you know, that's the best you can do. And then use that as your legal and then use the portfolio ID number because I think that's going to work. And the street address, if you put all of those in, I think you're good. But that's th those are when I really get worried, meets and bounds. Yeah, I, I think you're one of the lawyers that works on the part of our contracts. You know, how come the property ID number I mean, the neighbor contract. Uh, we neighbor thought contract. we thought we had enough with the, with the legal and the street address. We thought that was sufficient. We didn't need to add another line. We thought the contract was long enough. Anytime that we make a change, that contract we're running into oh, you know, how many pages do we have? And if you look at it, it's twelve full pages right now. And Lord knows we don't want to take any of those lines away that you guys can draft things in. So if we put anything else in, you know. You might have to take those lines out or move it to another page. So that that's one of the reasons. Uh, the main reason is a brevity, trying to brevity twelve page contract. So we do the best we can with that too. Do you consider time about being attached to your listing delivery? No, no, nothing in MLS is a delivery, and it's not part of your contract. So you really need to put them outside. The problem with that also is that this contact. Those, contra those condo documents get revised. And this time of year is when they revise them. They're all down here and they're voting on amending and doing this and changing their rules and everything. So if you have provided something, next week it's not current anymore. Uh, until your buyer gets current, it ain't, it ain't the whole package. So that's a little, that's a little dangerous. Okay? And that's not, people do that to be helpful, but if you rely on that, you're taking that chance. So I think you always need to go to the condo get a complete set of documents, and then go through those documents because uh, with some frequency, the condo, and not trying to be you know, a problem, they'll include their budget instead of the financial statement. That's a real common mistake made by condo associations. Well, I mean, you know, they're required to by law, so um, they have to keep sufficient copies on to make it available. So that, No, it's, I mean, that's, that's the only place you, well, you, those you get out of the public records, but there's other documents you cannot get. The financial statement, you can't get the rules and regs as a general rule, you know, that, so that. That would actually help the financial statement come up. A lot of these associations are only given to the owners. Some of them will not give it to an agent. Okay. Well, if a seller wants to sell, it's, it's kind of behooves the seller to get that stuff. Done. <laughs> okay. Anybody, anybody else? Going once, going twice. All right, we're all done. Good to see you guys.